Hello, we want to welcome you to another episode of Crooked Courage. We are so excited today to have Lucille Sider with us, who is the author of Light Shines in the Darkness. But more than that, she's a wonderful human being with a wonderful story to tell. <clears throat> a while ago, I went to a, 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 a conversation on violence. And this conversation took place between people that live in Indiana and Illinois. And we really tried to contemplate how to have a conversation that doesn't polarize people. And one of the ways that they had this conversation was to listen to people's stories. And there's, the beauty in people's stories is are that you cannot argue with a story. You kind of just appreciate the story for what it is and listen to that story. And so one of the things we do on Crooked Courage is we listen to people's stories. And today we have a beautiful story that we hope to hear a little bit more about. And so I'd like to welcome Lucille Sider onto our show, Crooked Courage. Delighted to be here. Yes, yes, yes. So Lucille, um, Tell me a little bit about just your name. A lot of times I ask people how did they come to have their name. While Lucille seems common enough, I've not heard of Cider. Yes. S-I-D-E-R. Yes. So. yes. Um, I'm, I'm named Lucille. I'm named after uh, a woman my mother really admired. Mm -hmm. But I never met her. Well, I never met her. She was gone by the time I came along. Okay. Um, insider, um, well, I was raised in a Mennonite brother in Christ situation, and we were from Pennsylvania, and there was a lot of Snyders and Siders and all kinds of variations, and that's my family name. Okay. My middle name is Faith. Uh huh. Uh, I, at first it was spelled F A Y T H E, I changed it to F-A-I-T-H, being a woman of faith. And who, who did your mom, your dad, or how did you get your middle name? From them. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, F-A-Y-T-H-E, they had that. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. Well, uh, most of the people we've interviewed at this point live in Hyde Park, and so I assume that you live in Hyde Park from some of our conversation, and so just wanted to ask you, uh, how did you come to live in Hyde Park, and what are other places in the world you've lived beside Hyde Park? Well, um, I started in Canada. I'm a Canadian. Came to the U.S. for college. Uh, never left. I was in Pennsylvania in college. Yale Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. Back to Chicago for my Ph.D. at Northwestern. Loved Chicago. Did most of my professional life here. and. Um, and after I went through some difficult times, I decided I wanted to come back to Chicago and be with my two closest friends, lifelong friends. Frank, uh, since uh, we were in our 30s, and Elise Clairbaut, since we were, were in, since tw age 27. So this is my true home. Well, it's good to have you back here. Um, before when you live, according to your book, you lived on the north side, mm -hmm. mostly. And this mm -hmm. time, how did you come to pick Hyde Park coming back to Chicago? Um, primarily because this is where Frank was. Okay. But I loved Hyde Park. My son graduated from the University of Chicago. I mean, Hyde Park it was just always in my life. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's coming home in some real way. Mm -hmm. So, I got a chance to read this book and I just want to say that I think writing a book is, is just a, a great accomplishment. I mean, just to be able to put that many words on a page and be able to try to tell a story or put something together, I think being able to write a book and do it well is, is an accomplishment. Um, does it feel like an accomplishment to you and how how do you, how is it an accomplishment, this book? Oh, it's very much, feels like an accomplishment. Um, I was part of the feminist movement long ago, started a Christian magazine, Daughters of Sarah, long mm -hmm. ago. So to be part of the movement again, the Me Too movement, why I didn't report, it just was the right thing to do. And um, it wasn't my idea. 
mm -hmm. uh, my friend, Elise, of 47 years, um, called me one day and said, uh, I just was to a one-woman show, and I'd like to do a one, produce a one-woman show of your story. Would that be okay? And I said, okay. She said, well, you'll need to write it. I said, I have no idea how to write it. So we tracked down Arlene, Dr. Arlene Malinowski, who writes, mm -hmm. teaches one woman shows, and um, she had me do a, some writing, and she said, this has to be a book first, mm -hmm. and I will guide you in writing the book. So that's how the book came about. Mm -hmm. How many years did it take to put these words on page, just the first draft? Just the first draft? Uh, uh, two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And for people that are looking that have not had an opportunity to read the book and may not know what it's about, could you give us like a one sentence on, you know, what you would say in a nugget uh, this book is about? Well, the second Self part, title. yeah, the, the title. It's My Healing Journey Through Sexual Abuse and Depression. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it's about mm -hmm. and uh, while it was dark at times the light always came through i have been so blessed mm -hmm. with so many people offering light to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the book it seems like you were evolving um maybe on in several lanes um one of the words that uh, uh, phrases I, I hold on to from reading the book is the notion of forgiveness and how complicated that is. A lot of times in the church, sometimes we can make things seem so black or white and really there are shades and shades and shades. And so uh, in the book, you grapple with forgiveness. And I wonder if you have any wisdom to offer to people who have been victims. Um, there's a lot of discussion uh, when certain things have happened in America that the victim should forgive. And oftentimes the perpetrator or people with power will tell those who feel powerless they should forgive. And I'm not saying, again, it's a black or white, but do you have any wisdom for someone who's grappling uh, with forgiveness any words of wisdom just on forgiveness? Yeah, it takes a long time. And it takes an open heart. And it means going back and forth. One day you think, ah, I'm, I don't hate him so much. And the next day you wake up, mm -hmm. just <laughs> furious. Um, it's a, for me, it was a very long journey. Um, I went to a couple retreats, mm -hmm. spiritual retreats, uh, and uh, I had some experiences there. Uh, one was I was in my room, and a light seemed to go from me to my brother-in-law who was sitting in jail and who had abused me, and another to my sister who was in their farm. It was just a pure light. And after that, most of the rage was gone. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was able to write a forgiveness letter. Mm -hmm. He had asked forgiveness, and we, I was just enraged. Uh, he was asking it from prison, and I thought it was to get a shorter sentence. But it started working on me. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. Love your enemies. Uh, but it really was going to these, retre these retreats and having my heart opened. Mm -hmm. And then it came. So would you say that you are still on this journey of forgiveness or would you say that you experienced a radical sense of forgiveness and it's complete. Uh, it's mainly in the past. Mm -hmm. It's it's mainly in the past. But I want to tell you a, another experience of forgiveness. 
I have been enraged at my father, just enraged mm -hmm. for not defending me. Mm -hmm. um, and Frank and I uh, do uh, a version of the Lord's Prayer, his version, uh, and we're on the floor at this point in the shape of a cross, and the words are, what are the words, right? Loosen. Loosen the knots that form within and between us, freeing us to forgive. And I was on the floor saying those words, and one time I got up and I said, the for I've forgiven my father, it's gone. Mm -hmm. But I was on the floor do doing that uh, four years before it came. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something that seems to be really important in your life as a spiritual discipline is, are these, I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but a sense of, uh, of meditation, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on it that has kind yeah. of... Well, we, way back when we were in our 30s, mm -hmm. um, we started a meditation group. Frank was the pastor. Mm -hmm. I was the psychologist in the church, and another friend uh, and I started meeting for meditation. And way back then, it was Merton. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for several years, uh, I didn't do a lot of meditation. But in the last uh, 15, at least 15 years, Meditation has been very much part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, Frank and I meditate twice a week, and we have a meditation group consisting of of eight people, and uh, we meet once a week um, since the pandemic. Uh, and it, it's just a wonderful group of people, mm -hmm. week <coughs> after eight week, uh, sharing and caring for each other. So meditation is just part of who I am. I can't live without it, wouldn't want to. So like doctors say movement is good for arthritis, would you say that meditation is good for your soul? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And singing is, a, is a, also a big part of it for me. Um, I wake up singing a hymn almost every morning and uh, I make it my business to, to sing that hymn during the day. That's my practice. So meditation, singing. Mm -hmm. I also took a peek over on Facebook and I think I saw that you deal with plants, indoor and outdoor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yes. <laughs> they, they were beautiful. I mean, I have a plant that could probably use your help. <laughs> I, I take in all the plants. <laughs> you know, I have a couple of my friends, I mean, we don't like to be known as killer of plants, but you know, sometimes they, they reach a peak and then they start <laughs> descending. So um, what do plants do for you? Is that a part of your healing or your nourishment, your spiritual nourishment? It's, it's all of that, yes. Mm -hmm. It's caring for them and just loving to watch them grow and change. And uh, um, I, uh, the first inquire, uh, um, the first thing that I must have in an apartment is lots of uh, window space. Mm -hmm. And I have 15 feet of window space. I could use more. But, um, yeah, I, I love it. I mm -hmm. love it. So I kind of started out, um, for someone who has not read your book, it might, uh, they may not... It, it might be a little jolting. So I did want to go back and just ask, maybe so that those that are watching can understand a little bit about the book, what is the beginning assaults or the impacting, feel like they color a large part of your life? Yeah. I was sexually abused at six, at age six, mm -hmm. by the f hired man on our family farm. And uh, I kept that a secret, didn't tell anyone. Um, that felt extremely guilty and angry and uh, and then I was sexually abused at age 15 by my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, I was helping them in their new house and at night he came and assaulted me. Um, 
I went home and I told my parents, my father is a minister. And they prayed about it, but they never said a word about it after that. Never again. And I was always waiting for them to say something. They never did. And uh, I had a lot of anger towards my father, a whole lot. And, and that's, uh, you know, that burdened me for years and years and years. And I'm so grateful that now that burden uh, is off of me. Uh, but uh, when, when I was, uh, let's see, 50 years after 50, age 15, my brother-in-law was arrested for abusing another little 15-year-old girl. And it became clear that this man has been abusing women for at least 50 years. And we figured it out that it was at least 60 or 70 women. Mm -hmm. So we took it to court. And that was so freeing. That was just so freeing to be able to tell the whole world what had happened and to know that he would be in jail. Um, that was very important for me. Yes, I think in your book, this girl that reported it, um, I think you saw. So the name of our show is Crooked Courage, mm -hmm. and I think in your book you talked about this girl giving you the courage mm -hmm. to come forward yes. with your truth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What gives you courage today? My, my ongoing prayer life, mm -hmm. ongoing deep, deep friends. Um, I do exercise and uh, you know, things like that. Um, but it's just those normal things, uh, spirituality and physical. I'm not crazy about cooking. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's funny you should say that because one of my questions is, if you were cooking a meal and you could only invite one guest, what would you cook and who would you invite if that person could be someone living or an ancestor? I think that person would be Elise, mm -hmm. my friend, since uh, age 27. Now, if I can invite two, you invite <laughs> this, this, yeah. this other person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what would you cook? Oh. <laughs> since you don't like to cook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I likely cook stroganoff. Okay. I like stroganoff. You know, add a lot of paprika and mm -hmm. a few extra mushrooms. It's easy. Yes, yes. Um, also in your book, you uh, one, I think your family sounds incredible. So it's, it's kind of interesting that the point of injury is family. But the, the point of strength has, has also been your family. Your family is incredible. I think at one point I just kind of, you know, experienced like, wow, this family has come to your support over, especially with the damage of the house. Yes. Just the way your family mm -hmm. reached in. Yeah. Um, incredible, mm -hmm. incredible family. You were talking about your son um, a, lot, a lot in the book, and it, it seems like you have a very close and endearing relationship with him. But you were saying at one point he was introducing you to his friends, and you thought he might be embarrassed that you were mentally ill, but he showed no embarrassment yeah. yes. in that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I want to talk a little bit about what has that label, because you talk about mental illness and kind of your struggle with it. Yeah. What has that label meant to you? It meant negative things, inadequacy, even though I'm a clinical psychologist. Right, theoretically. Yeah, theoretically, yeah. You know, minister and clinical psychologist, I, uh, I shouldn't be dumping on myself. But it, it has been very hard to come to accept that I am a person that lives with mental illness. Uh, and that I have a whole variety of practices that help me stay strong mentally. Uh, I don't expect to ever be free of it, and it's okay. It's it's quite okay, and and part of my mission is to say to others, it's okay. 
we're okay. Yeah, it, it took a lot of, of treatments for me to come to stability. And it takes quite a lot to stay. I'm in therapy. I take medication. Um, I've even been hospitalized in the last while for, for a brief period of time. So. Um, it's never going away, I don't think, and that's okay. I wonder if that's a light. Um, so let me say a little bit more. Um, uh, try not to say um so much. <laughs> but uh, I um, look at the LGBTQ world, mm -hmm. and for many in the LGBTQ world, it's almost like when a celebrity or someone well-known comes out, like that is a light for them. That's something to feel proud of, that hey, this is one more mm -hmm. that represents us. And I think it's important for people to see mm -hmm. themselves somewhere in a, in a positive way or yeah. what they could be. Mm -hmm. um, I know as a, a pastor, one day one of my members came to me because people had been telling her she should have faith and she was bipolar and she was like, is it okay for me to take my medicine? Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder when there are people of faith that are saying, hey, I struggle with a mental illness, but I am still wonderfully created by God, mm -hmm. if you provide a light to someone else on the journey that may be yeah. you know, in a different space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so it's um, something to you know, come to a space of not really feeling ashamed yeah, about. It's, it's, accept a, it's, a, it's really accepting. Yeah. This is how I am, and uh, it's okay. Also, another re I think refreshing thing about your book is that if you work, if you do the work, you know there is a path of, yes. of life. And I think in your in the book, you did a lot of work. It was hard work, and you did a relapse. You did you know, and that's life. You take two steps forward, you take steps backward, but. You really did the work of wanting to be well. Yeah. And I will keep doing that work it or whatever stop. it takes Yeah. until the very end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel yourself to be a spokesperson? And maybe not. Some people say that's not mine. You know, do you feel yourself to be a spokesperson for people who have suffered sexual abuse? Do you feel like you are now in a space to be a spoke spokesperson and shed light? Yes, absolutely. No, it's part of my calling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just part of my calling. And when the Me Too movement popped up, I was just as happy as can be. I'm part of that. And uh, yeah, no, this is part of my calling. <laughs> it's that simple. Yes, yes. Um, in the story, um, in your story, um, some of my sadness is that the church kind of was a harmful agent. Maybe not the church, but theology. And so while theology can be liberating, we recognize the complicated nature of how theology can harm, can harm mm -hmm. and create the space for silence. Um, there was one part in your book where your sister, when you shared what her husband had did to you, and what, and the fact you went to your parents, and your parents kind of prayed about it, and then they didn't do anything else, um, she made the statement that they chose me. And I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you reported that, and I don't know if you accepted it. But I don't, I wondered if they chose her or if they just were constrained. I don't know, I don't know. Did you give any pushback to that or what, did, did you agree with her? I, and I was just surprised. I, uh, but we never talked about it. We never talked about it. Maybe, maybe we'll talk about it sometime. Right, right. So your book kind of ends with your sister, who was married to the brother-in-law that um, violated you, supporting her, and violated her daughter. Yes. 
as well. That's an important component. Yes, absolutely. Um, because what that means for your niece is, you know, is kind of like your relationship with your parents as well. So she has a different work. Um, but you end the book with you are speaking to your sister. It's not the ideal relationship, but you've moved from that place of, and it kind of happened when you were able to forgive and kind of, mm -hmm. so you have some relationship. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, since you've written the book, because it's been a couple of years now since mm -hmm. the book got published, mm -hmm. is the, has that relationship improved or is it about the same places where you ended the book? It's improved a little bit. Um, we, she calls me about every three weeks and we talk about recipes and flowers, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, we do not discuss this situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I ever will, but uh, now is not the time. Do you know if she's read the book or she knows you published the book? She knows I published it. I don't know if she's read it. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll ask her sometime. But uh, we don't go. To it's like you don't go in the deep end. You, yeah. stay, you stay on the, at the shore. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And I've had to um, accept that that's likely how it will be. And it's better than nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, since you've published the book, how did your family respond to the book? They, uh, they were very supportive. Mm -hmm. They, they were so glad to understand some things that, that never made sense to them, and. Um, yeah, they're encouraging me. Except one thing, one of my family members was quite upset with me because I said some negative th things about my father. And it's taken us some time to get comfortable again. Uh, but the other family members were really encouraging me to mm -hmm. to write it and to get it published and my my brother is Ron Sider and he has a big reputation and he and his wife were the family members that read it first and they just thought it was great and they encouraged me and um, introduced me to people uh, so to have to have him means a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, this uh, is a phenomenal accomplishment. You say it took you two and a half years to do it. And so did you write, like, how did that work? You said you had coaching mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. Did you write blocks of it in a week, or how did that? I, uh, I took two or three mornings a week, and um, wrote about an hour and a half, and that's all I could do. Mm -hmm. I had to then step away and, and breathe. Uh, and of course, all kinds of issues came up in the writing that I hadn't thought of, so I had to uh, discuss that with friends, family, therapist. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a healing experience, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very glad I wrote it for that reason, as well as for these other reasons. But after about a, an hour and a half, my body would just sort of get tight. And I had to go and work in the garden or, or something. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why it took that long. Yeah. No, I can imagine, you know, um, as a writer myself. So uh, did you feel like religion was both a source of strength and a source of pain for you mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. this? Yes. And the same with family. Sure. Mm -hmm. Of sort of. Mm -hmm. So if there is one piece of good news or one piece of wisdom you could share with um, a survivor or someone that's still in the throes, what might that one piece of wisdom be? 
would be just to encourage them to move forward, to, to uh, take the situation to court if necessary, but I would, I would want them to be so careful. Uh, but it's when one does really tell it to the whole world that there's a deeper freedom mm -hmm. than ever before. Do you think you were ready? Like I hear some people say, I'm not ready, but I take the leap. And there's some people, were you ready to write this story or you stepped into it? It wasn't my idea, but this wonderful person said I'm a great writer and she'll, uh, she'll teach me. She'll be my writing teacher. Well, I think that's a door that's opened. <laughs> I would have never thought of it. Um, the circumstance has been that. That's good. Well, we thank you so much for this book. Um, and uh, if you are watching us, uh, we have some books for sale. Now, how much do they, how much? They're $20. These books are not free. They are $20, but it is $20 worth of reading. It's a good book. And um, just a wonderful story of doing the work, of really doing the work and coming out uh, in, 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 a, in a good place. Yeah. I am, I am blessed. I am truly blessed. So we have a couple of copies, and even if we run out, I'm sure you'll make some more available. <laughs> I, I'm sure I could. <laughs> I'm sure I could. So $20, if you would love to get your copy, we'd love to uh, have you uh, purchase it. Um, again, it's just a, a good book. So what do you do for fun? Uh, I uh, walk. I have my flowers. I uh, sing. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I just and things walk by the lake. In this whole period of COVID, have you watched a, a good movie that you would recommend to others? Uh, or you you just uh, didn't take the bite. You didn't take the movie. No, bite. I didn't take the movie bite. What yeah. about the book bite? Yeah. Uh, Anything light? Yeah, and I can see you heavy. Yeah. <laughs> A light book lately? No, no. You know, I'm reading White Fragility. Okay. And <laughs> That's not light. And discussing it's white, that. but it's not light. It's, it's discussing that with friends. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, usually I will end my interview by asking this question. You've looked at the tape, so you already know this question is Do you have any, what's on your bucket list to do? with the, the gift of time that you have left. Yeah, it's, um, it's to continue to promote this book and go around. Uh, uh, I have some um, um, children in our building that I'm very close to. Mm -hmm. So I'm like a grandmother to them. Mm -hmm. And I will continue to do that as long as, as we can. Um, I will continue to grow flowers and buy flowers and give flowers away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm so excited because Trader Joe's now has flowers for $4 for a bunch. So, you know, I'm discovering now I just serve Facebook, but people sell flowers on Facebook that they've grown in their own homes. Um, so uh, my cousin has become quite the, you know, surrounding herself. So I've gotten up to four, but one, is like this uh, lily plant right mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, and our secretary has really nursed it to health. And yeah. I don't know what it is, but I'm starting to get yellow leaves. So I don't know what I need, but I'm willing to bring it to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to nurse it back. Absolutely. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. So on your bucket list is to really continue to promote your book and to get that word out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's needed for women on the journey or people who have gone through mm -hmm. some really stuff, mm -hmm. uh, rough stuff, uh, to know that there is a way. Yeah. Yeah. This is my calling. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Lucille for being on the show. Um, I think, yeah, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me.